Too often, the media focuses exclusively on the violent and tumultuous crises occurring daily around the world, and with clickbait exploiting negative social events for the sake of increased ratings and revenue, there are few incentives for media outlets to focus on the good that is happening in the world every day. Even media channels de dedicated to peace building and sustainable development remain focused on the ills of corruption, war, and conflict, rather than the efforts of peace builders within those conflicts. But peace talks too. And with this show, the voice of peace will be amplified. Mr. Rogers is often quoted in saying that when crisis strikes, look for the helpers. This show intends to do just that. Every day, right here in Vermont, there are thousands of engaged citizens actively building peace. And we plan to amplify their efforts and, and we seek to develop a platform where peace builders all over the state and the US at large can connect with each other across social boundaries and industry sectors to collaborate for the benefit of our collective community. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Peace Talks. And today we are meeting with Tamara Parks. She is an educator, an advocate for new Americans, and the director of the multilingual program through the Essex Westford School District. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today, Tamara. I am delighted to be able to talk with you about this subject. Um, yeah, so let's just uh, kick it right off. Tell us about yourself. What are you doing right now? Thank you. It's great to be here. Yeah. Um, I am the district coordinator of multilingual learner programs in Essex Westford. And um, to start to tell you about myself, my name is Tamara Parks, but I often go by Tamara Ekloff Parks. Okay. And I, as a child, um, I was actually born in the U.S. and Mm. Then my family um, moved back to Russia, and we and I went to kindergarten there. Okay, so, so. yeah, um, what parts of Russia were were you living? So we were living in Moscow, and um, my ancestry is actually Georgian and Latvian, okay. and Russian. Um, my father and mother are both uh, professors in. Russian history and Russian literature. Wow. And my mother is an immigrant. Okay. Yeah, so um, what was that like? Uh, you were born in the U.S., but you spent your early childhood in, what is that, the, the southwestern parts of Russia over there by Georgia before it was its own country, right? Yeah. Um, the memories I have are, um, they they're pretty powerful memories okay uh, one of them is um, in the morning my parents would have to take me to school mm -hmm. on skis <laughs> and um, I just remember having conversations with my grandmother who uh, had to I don't want to say kidnap um, she had to take me to get me baptized uh, there's you know a lot Take take you to get you baptized. Yeah. Let's let's unravel that a little bit. I I need to, I need a little more context. Like why why would your grandma need to to kidnap you or or take you away to get baptized? Can can you speak to that a little bit? I more? can a little bit. Yeah. There's in at that time, and I think maybe still in Russia, there's consequences for having religious beliefs and participating in religion. Yeah. And so that was something really important to her and. Um, so I just remember, um, you know, that relationship with my grandmother, and um, I also on the way over here, I was just remembering a time where, um, you know, I was speaking with her in Russian, and I was uh, upset with her because um, she wanted me to wink my eye, ah. and I couldn't do it with both eyes, and <laughs> we had this whole conversation with each other about, um, you know, winking and how to wink, and a uh, very special relationship. Wow. Yeah, no, that's, uh, so your mother, your grandmother, she, she grew up in that same region of the world, uh, the southwestern parts of Russia. Um, this was during the Soviet Union that you're talking about, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And my uh, grandfather, he uh, is a wonderful man. He 
uh, was there's a lot going on there. I could tell you a long, fascinating story um, with him, and if you have time, I will. Yeah, tell you a may, bit yeah, more. maybe maybe we can get into that a little bit, but uh, that might have to be a longer conversation for later. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so, like, you went to kindergarten, and then you moved back to the U.S. after that. Uh, like, so what what was that about? Um, why the back and forth? Maybe we can... Yeah, figure. I mean, they were doing... Uh, so, my father is a Russian historian, and um, my mother's roots are there, and so uh, they, from what I know, they had, there was some work to do there, and okay. um, then when they came back here, I had been attending a school in the U.S., but we had ended up in Baltimore. Okay. And so my experience there, I would say, wasn't the most welcoming. Um, when for, you came back yeah, to the U.S.? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, why, so they were, your parents were there primarily for work, um, and your mother, you said, was an immigrant, yeah. um, and so um, was was the move back to the U.S. just because the work ended, or was this like connected to turmoil in Russia? Or oh, I'm sure it was about the work ending. Um, my father had has spent a lot of time in Russia, regardless of turmoil. Um, ah. Maybe not at this day and time, but um, previous times um, during the collapse of the Soviet Union, and uh, so I'm sure that it had something to do with work um, and for me as a child you know my memories are primarily a, around school and family and you yeah. know, things like that yeah no now in regards to memories you mentioned a, a particular memory just before we got started about your father being on on CNN oh. um, like that was fascinating and I think it relates to a little bit about what we're doing here uh, do you mind sharing that uh, as well? Sure. Um, so he was a core. I think the word is correspondent. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to being a historian, and uh, one of my memories as a child is watching him on TV, and he was in a burning hotel during a coup, wow. and he would, you know, he, my question as a child to him was like, "What's it like to be on TV?" And he was like, "The lights are really bright." <laughs> 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 but he uh, he did some work there too, um, kind of just as an expert reporting wow. out. And, My goodness, um, kind of uh, wrapped up in the middle of all that uh, turmoil and transition at that time. And then you ended up in Baltimore. Yeah, so they were working at Goucher College and we lived on campus. And okay. then we I was attending a pretty conservative public school. Mm. Um, there was a my school photo was a picture of me in front of the um, American flag. Wow. How was that for you? You know, um, y your, your early childhood years in the kind of collapsing Soviet Union, um, obviously tied to like deep historical and political roots because of your parents' background. Uh, and now you're in this conservative uh, school in Baltimore having to stand in front of an American flag for your picture. Like, uh, can, can you, like, what was the experience, what was that experience like? Oh, well, I remember in, in uh, Russia, the kindergarten I went to was very strict. And one of my memories mm. there was um, getting in trouble for eating my soup wrong. And it's one of the few times I've ever gotten in trouble as a child. Yeah. And then coming to Baltimore, the school was also strict, uh, but um, I didn't know the words to the Pledge of Allegiance, and I still think I'm saying it wrong. Pledge of Allegiance. I, yeah. I don't know. Um, but uh, while I was trying to say that um, during every morning we had to say it, um, these boys behind me were, um, you know, pretending to shoot me and they called me names, you know, communist and whatnot. And um, I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, so, at the time, because yeah, you were just so time. young. Yeah, so one of my, unfortunately, one of my earliest memories was not being welcomed. Um, that my uh, culture was not welcome and that I was not welcome. And yeah. But the teacher was uh, pretty good. She just... She responded? She responded and in the moment. And, good. Um, 
I think she tried to make it a welcoming environment. So I always felt welcomed by my teachers. Yeah. Um, but there were definitely times where what was going on politically was impacting me as a child, and I didn't understand. Yeah, well, I mean, you were coming into America with uh, a Russian name and a Russian heritage at the collapse of the Soviet Union after, what, 50 years of, you know, Red Scare, Cold War era politics in, in American life and culture. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's apparent if there's little kindergarten boys pretending to shoot you uh, for not being able to say the Pledge of Allegiance, that's, that's got to be a very intense experience uh, to try and grapple with. I'd say what it does for me in a way in my life, I've tried to turn these experiences into strengths and it is a way for me to have a lot of empathy for anyone who's coming in who may not be feeling welcomed. Um, mm. I can't at all say that I understand everything people experience. I can't yeah. ever do that. Um, but what I can say is that I do have a tremendous em empathy for, um, especially for children who are coming in who are not knowing how to navigate um, yeah. and not really fully understanding all the political forces that are happening. Huh. Huh. Yeah. So, like, uh, there's, there's this book that you and I have talked about a little bit. Um, uh, this is actually something that I was made aware of by my wife. Uh, it's called uh, Third Culture Kids, Growing Up Among Worlds. Um, I, were you able to look into that at all? Or like, I, I know the title kind of speaks for itself. Um, it sounds like you had to grow up among worlds, like, you know, with the, again, the professional and political background of your parents. Uh, you, had to, you had to grapple with this idea of, multiple worlds, multiple world views all the time. What was that like growing up? Oh, I, in a lot of ways, I think it's a gift. Uh, yeah. I think it, having a home language different than English is um, an amazing experience to have, you know, my parents trying to talk about um, things that they think that we don't understand and using big words in, in that language and actually mm -hmm. being able to understand. But um, just having that uh, uniqueness is, mm. a, is a big, it's a wonderful thing. Um, it also creates a lot of um, unique situations. And so um, the feeling of not really ever fitting in anywhere, um, it's also hard to answer the question, where are you from? Mm. And, um, the, you know, it's, it's, definitely um, a lot of things, I'd say. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, this idea of it being a gift, that uh, that's, feels like a very matured perspective. That feels like something that yeah. you grew into. Um, like, I, I, I imagine, um, you know, the, this story you share of the Pledge of Allegiance and trying to, trying to you know, fit in, uh, having your parents speak a different language at home. Uh, you don't have a Russian accent, so you've clearly been able to to learn English at a young enough age and, and um, get involved in that way. Like, can you speak to what that was like trying to fit in as you were growing up? Like, how did that mature into this space where you're like, this is actually a gift. This is actually something that can help, can can serve me. In, in my world? Oh, that's a great question. I, to be honest, I think I was trying to hide everything about me that was unique for many years. Mm. Uh, I, like what? Can you, can you maybe have some specifics? Sorry yeah. to interrupt. <laughs> no, it's I'm... okay. Um, my name, for example, um, so my name, Tamara Parks, is uh, not the name that my family and closest friends call me. They call me Toma Ekloff. Okay. And so I had Americanized the pronunciation of my first name and um, dropped my last name and changed it to my married name, which is Americanized version of Pushkosh. Um, and so I ended up with um, a very like easy, easy to pronounce name, mm -hmm. um, but something didn't feel right. And so now I've gone back and hyphenated 
my original last name and started to share with more more people I meet um, how yeah. you know how how they can call me like you and and um, your family can call me Toma because yeah. we are friends. So okay. <laughs> so you yeah. can. I mean, that's an example of it. it takes a little bit for me, but um, because I still feel a little bit um, like I won't fit in. Yeah. Mm. That so this uh, this uh, kind of touches on a point that I think uh, you and I have spent a lot of time exploring uh, about you know assimilation versus integration you know when when immigrants and when when new americans are are coming to this country and and they have to figure out how to be a part of our community um you know i think the the conventional methods the the historical or traditional methods um uh, are kind of captured in this name change right it's that's a process of assimilation mm -hmm. that's a that's um uh, and that 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 kind of imposes on you this this uh, this need to hide those parts of yourself that don't fit the the culture in the community you're a part of. Yeah. Um, like how how do you how did you grapple with that growing up, and how do you feel about it now? Like this idea of assimilation. Yeah, I have a lot of feelings about that. Yeah, um, please elaborate. <laughs> um, so I started my teaching career, um, actually I started in Florida for one year and then I moved to New York City um, around 2005. Yeah. And um, my second year I was invited to help start a new school for um, students who were newly arrived to the U.S. and um, I was surrounded with people speaking different languages in Queens and New York mm -hmm. City. I don't think I've ever felt so welcomed and, you know, accepted. Um, there were just, in Queens, there's just so many different languages and so many, so much different food. And in this school that we were starting, um, there, I learned a lot of really good things. And we were mm. collaborating with a community organization and, okay. um, immigrant people were standing up for their rights and going on marches and proud to have this unique background and uh, unique to the U.S. and um, really kind of pushing against this notion of assimilation, yeah, this idea that we all have to fit some kind of monoculture. Mm -hmm. And we had students who spoke indigenous languages and the teachers were just you know working to um, promote how wonderful that is in the school and so um, it was moving to New York City and living there for 16 years that really helped me understand, um, you know, I think New York City opened her arms to me and um, don't want to get emotional, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, that must that have place. been such a validating experience, you know, given, given the experience you had originally coming to this country and, having to feel like you have to hide parts of yourself and then entering this space where you're just inundated by cultural diversity and an embrace of those differences in fact a celebration of those differences that must have been such a validating experience for you how did that how did that change your perspective on the world is that is that i have too many questions let's start there how did that change your perspective on the world Oh, I mean, I don't know. I, I actually don't know the answer. Um, <clears throat> I would, I will say that I still feel very connected to that, um, the students and the teachers and the community. And um, I also am, you know, developing connections with families here also. Mm. So for me, I am just learning that um, the power of being in this collective space with others um, who are just bringing all their uh, everything about them that's unique and wonderful and um, it's, it's just where I like to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's the space I like to be no matter what state I'm in is, is around people who have a multitude of perspectives yeah. and languages and uh, backgrounds and stories. Yeah, you found your home within diversity, 
you found your home within that acceptance of difference rather than you know having to find a way to fit into one thing yeah and i think that connects to that culture idea of cultural wealth that it, i think we can all find that that wonderful experience in groups of people who are very different from us and um i recommend it <laughs> yeah um well you know something that i'm thinking about as you're talking uh, on this is like you, uh, the American dream, you know, like this, this idea of the American dream, it, I think it has a bit of a salty taste for a lot of people right now. This, uh, this concept of, you know, uh, you know, you, you come to America, we can, you can change your stars, uh, you know, it's, it's the melting pot of the world. Um, and there's this contrast between what you're talking about here, right? There's this, there's the the American dream as it was propagated, as it was distributed throughout the world for a hundred plus years, hundreds of years. Um, and then there's your experience as a child that, that doesn't really fit that dream. Um, in contrast to like this experience you're talking about in New York City where where things were a little different. Like what what does that mean to you? What does the American dream mean to you? Oh, I mean, I, I think in a lot of ways, my family had probably a much, much, m much fewer barriers. Um, so there are, there is this idea of, um, you know, pull yourself up by the bootstraps, uh, you will do it, everyone will do it. But what, um, what I see is that um, the reality doesn't really match um, the that, experience. that kind of, um, you know, concept, and uh, there's a lot of barriers for people. And um, <clears throat> what kind of barriers are you talking about? Um, so, you know, for example, I'm white, and my family's white, and so that probably, definitely, uh, resulted in privilege that allowed us to uh, more easily access things that um, would help us be successful, and. Um, we also the you know in terms of immigration status um, that can also create a lot of barriers in terms of um, accessing support um, so yeah I mean I think it really depends a lot um, the American dream is not as available to all it's not as available to all mm -hmm. um, yeah and these barriers I'm, I'm kind of just stewing on that in my head um, you know, and it, it, it ties into this this dichotomy that we're talking about, assimilation versus acculturation. It sounds like a lot of those barriers are tied to this notion of assimilation, like how well you can fit in to the to the dominant culture, right? Um, you know, it's a uh, it it's uh, it's a tough thing to swallow. I think you know if if we think about the American dream in its ideal state, this, this idea that, you know, anyone can come here and we can all, uh, you know, uh, participate together uh, through some, uh, through the democratic process and, and through the opportunities that uh, America purportedly provides. But, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel like what you're saying, uh, I don't feel like that fits in with this notion of assimilation. Yeah. 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 Uh, so we've, we've kind of looked at your experience uh, in New York a as kind of a counter to that, more of an integrative process. What does integration mean to you? How, do, how, does, how is that different than assimilation? Oh, um, you know, it was funny. I think I was using it. Uh, the words incorrectly last week I was saying acculturation assimilation so for me assimilation is a um, the process of kind of blending in with the existing culture and uh, for me my current understanding integration would be coming in and um, retaining your culture and still being able to navigate and function within this new place mm. and um, I I believe it's a better goal to integrate rather than assimilate, um, because with assimilation, 
you would lose things that are not only important to you and your family and helping you feel connected to your roots, but also um, those things are really valuable to the incoming, um, the incoming place where you're where you're living. To the community, they should that be. You're yeah, a part I mean, of. they're untapped <laughs> potential. Potential. It, it um, people with different perspectives, different ways of knowing. Um, different foods, different um, ways of thinking um, inc can lend to incredible innovation, cultural wealth. Yeah, no, that, uh, that you know, the concept of innovation is, this is a bit of a departure, but I, I, I feel compelled to kind of share a little bit about like, you know, when we talk about innovation in a business sense, uh, one of the primary ingredients for innovation to occur is is a diversity of perspectives, a diversity of thinking, a diversity of knowledge bases. You know, and if if we've been driving towards assimilation, towards you know a mono culture or a mono experience, this singular way of doing things, that seems to be counterproductive to you know. Uh, American business and and you know these things we, it, it, like how do these both both of these values are are being coupled together that are a paradox it's they're they're ju they're at, in fact working against each other mm -hmm. but like when when we talk about integration when we talk about an acceptance of that diversity when we welcome it into our communities we benefit Right. Uh, how did the how did the community in New York benefit? What were some of the benefits you saw? Oh, um, hmm. well, New York as a whole. I mean, y you're going to have in any group of people. I think it, so. Uh, maybe I shouldn't talk in general about yeah, New York, but New York's a big place. It is a really big right? place, and there's a lot of different things going on. Um, but. Uh, I was actually, while you were talking, I was thinking of a simple example. Okay, yeah. Um, and <laughs> so there's, a, you know, in the school in Queens, what one of the things I learned was that different cultures view time differently. Hmm. And so we had, um, you know, in the U.S., it's kind of expected that you're punctual and, you know, when you say arrive at 8, that means arrive at 8. Or 7.55. Um, yeah, or yeah. even 7:55. Like <laughs> we all <laughs> try to get there early so that you know we can be there right at eight. Um, but when I was teaching, I was realizing that I would set up a meeting maybe with parents, and they would come in, you know, socialize, and then the meeting would start later than mm -hmm. normal. Mm -hmm. And it made me question whether how I was doing things was actually the best way. Maybe I didn't need to be so um, you know, synchronous with time. Maybe it was more important to focus on relationships, and wow. um, so there. So ju just different ways of looking at things. If you can, I think the most important thing is to be open to those different ways instead of being upset that um, parents will come later. Um, for me, it's it's mm -hmm. about asking why am I always so worried about starting on time? Yeah. Yeah, as a cultural value, as you know, that's a norm that has been kind of ingrained into us as as Americans, and uh, to, to you know, it's it's uh, it is etiquette. It, it, it you know, you're being polite and you're being respectful uh, by showing up on time, you know, respecting the other person's time. Uh, but what you're talking about in terms of like relationships. You know, it's a different kind of respect. You're respecting the relationship you have with that person where time isn't the most valuable thing. The most valuable thing is that you and this person that you're connecting with can share space together mm -hmm. and can appreciate each other. Another example would be um, if I'm, you know, as a teacher trying to have the best lesson plans that are just my own lesson plans, um, and the alternative might be that I focus my energy on making sure that all of my peers also have you know, what they need and that we're all together, working together as a group mm -hmm. collectively to get to make sure that the students are learning. Wow. So there's just um, different ways of doing things that uh, are valuable and um, new ideas and new perspectives. Huh. 
So let's let's kind of shift. I think we've really laid the groundwork here and established like this this framework, this perspective that you're bringing to the world, right? Uh, what are you doing in the community right now? Like in your role as a multilingual, as the you know director of multilingual program in Essex Westford School District, how do you how do you bring this experience, this and this rich perspective? into this work right now? What does that look like? So I will say that I'm relatively, I'm actually quite new to my role here. I started last year in the, in the role as a district coordinator of multilingual programs in Essex Westford. And um, the, a lot of my time has been uh, spent on kind of solidifying infrastructure and just making sure that um, you know, our interpreters and translators and multilingual liaisons have what they need and the EL teachers have what they need. And um, so that's been a big focus to make sure that the program is uh, solid and that we're in alignment with federal, state, local law and policy and um, just making sure everything is set up right. Right. Um, but another big focus was meeting the parents mm. and the best way I could think of to do that was to just throw a party. <laughs> I mean, essentially, that's what yeah. that was. Yeah. And so just threw a big party and a big potluck and invited every single parent who was interested in joining our multilingual potluck. And um, we ended up with a pretty nice sized group. And then um, from there, uh, I think it's really important to not just stay in that space of you know, celebrating diversity. We want to like continuously build community and continuously have opportunities to get to know each other, but um, also to create some structures for parents to get involved in in building the program together with me. And you're in that group. Yeah, so this is how we met each other. It is, and it's um, led to a lot of really wonderful things. And we've been building very slowly. So there's something about really taking time in meetings to get to know people. And then um, we set uh, one meeting for our community agreements and um, another meeting just to talk about our values because the values around the table, uh, we are all bringing in so many different experiences, lived experiences. And so that really, we needed to take a lot of time mm. for that. And uh, we, now, um, I think there were a few more steps and uh, halfway, actually getting closer to the end of the year, we're now just starting to talk about our goals that um, align with the district equity policy. And um, that's actually going to take another <laughs> meeting <laughs> because yeah. that was such a long, rich conversation. So yeah, having those, you know, creating those spaces to come together and do things together is something that I've I feel has been really um, helpful. Yeah, and powerful. Uh, you know, um, how is this? Uh, how do you feel like this is changing the experience for children? You know, you, we've talked a lot about your experience as a child coming into the U.S. and and having to grapple with this massive change in your in your life. You know, like what you're doing now in in our community here in Vermont in in this area. How is that changing? the experience of the children that you work with. So it's going to be hard for me to talk about this without crying. <laughs> um, I have to give you a heads up because I love it's your passion. A, it's a book. Um, so we sent I found a book called The Arabic Quilt. This is just an example of what we're doing. Uh, sent it out to all of the EL teachers and the community who receives our newsletter. And I found a video of someone reading the book. And the book is really um, I highly recommend that anyone involved in multilingual programs reads this book um, because it really just it has it's another story but it's similar to the one I shared earlier in this um, interview and it's about a little girl who um, comes into a school an elementary school and they make fun of her um, because she's speaking Arabic and um, what the teacher does is the is the best part of the book. She notices this and then she um, creates a lesson plan where 
all of the students' names are translated into Arabic and they put it up on a wall and they make this quilt out of the students' names. And the part that I'm, it's hard because I feel emotional about this, but one of our EL teachers took that, um, you know, just took that opportunity and actually turned, o turned it over and did that project in her school yeah. with the help of one of our Arabic multilingual oh liaisons, translated students' names into Arabic. And um, so it's these kind of things, you know, finding the resources to, um, you know, the EL teachers do so much and then whatever that I can do to support them in the wonderful work they're doing. Yeah. Um, and then it's, they take, sometimes they do something that it, will shift it, it, it things. It kind of, it's a cascade, right? You know, um, by, by creating this space and allowing for acceptance and this welcoming culture to be, to be allowed and to, and to be, um, you know, just present. Um, now you see those those seeds growing, right? You see people from within this community that you've helped create taking off and 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 creating their own things. Uh, and and you know, okay, I have to share a poem. Uh, this is a a poem I wrote in grad school when I was studying the theory and practice of peace building, and we were asked to. Um, we were asked to define conflict transformation with a haiku. You know, haiku is very short, five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, right? And so the poem goes, one drop ripples, but a thousand drops birth new life. Together we reign. And it's this togetherness, it's this collective participation that creates something new all on its own. We, 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 that's wealth, right? That's, that's new creation, right? We, we, this, the, the, the result that we're given and the continued results that come from that are far greater than the sum of the parts that we put into it, right? And, um, you know, I just, um, I, uh, I'm going to get emotional, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I, I find that to be such a powerful experience. And, um, you know, it's, most people would, would look at this kind of program that you're starting to develop and you're, you're talking about having translators, like a whole cater of translators for how many languages are you working with? Well, we have, th I think, around 36 in the district, but we, for the families that benefit from interpretation, um, there's around 14, and then we have um, three multilingual liaisons. Yeah. So, like, we, we, I think from an outside perspective, you know, with the bird's eye view, someone just passing along, they would look at that and say, wow, that is so complicated. And that's so much going on, and you know that's got to be an inefficient process. You know, there's all these things that could be said, um, but that that ignores the value that is created and the potential value that comes beyond that, right? You know, this is this is uh, you know I, I would argue that the, the the inputs, the things that that you're having to spend to create this are rather marginal in comparison to the value that is produced on the other end. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, I, I, no, hope, I just, really hope that's the case. Uh, I mean, I love to hear that the, the things that um, those people who are involved in the program are doing um, are making a change. And I, I think that's, that's what, that's the purpose is to make things better um, yeah. and I also want to add that by making things better for the multilingual and multicultural community it makes things better for everyone and that's yeah. the peace building part yeah that's what I was just about to ask is you know how are you how do you think you're building peace in the community like you know the, everything we've talked about is related to peace building but I want to zero in on that I want to distill it you know and I, I want to get your view on what that means for peace building, you know? How do you think you are actually building peace in our community today? Um, I think we're building peace 
and that's the difference is yeah it's not we just, we are building <laughs> <it's not laughs> thank just you me. for that distinction <laughs> together we're building peace and that's what's really exciting and it's um, something that I'm a part of and I um, I watch our multilingual advisory council meetings and they're facilitated by a different member in the council every meeting and some of the things um, some of our goals that we have are um, geared towards uh, helping educate people about the different cultures in the district and um, even creating a decision-making process within our advisory council. Um, and beyond the advisory council, um, it is also about making sure that we are setting things up in a way that people have access to the things they need in order to participate equitably. So mm. anyone who needs interpretation uh, should have access to an interpreter, anyone who has children in the school district. And um, there's, there's also a lot of really wonderful organizations in Vermont that support uh, immigrant people. And um, for me, as a newer multilingual coordinator, I am reaching out to those organizations, getting to know people, creating this big uh, network of support Building social capital, yeah, this, social wealth. Mm -hmm, that's connected to our families so that we we know um, who does what and who can help with what. And um, that's another part of it is um, kind of all, all hands on deck. Everyone, everyone's helping. It's not just this school building. It's part of like a much larger fabric. Yeah. 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 Well, um, I don't know what else I could say. I think you said it right there um, and uh, we the collective we are happy to have you be a part of this community I know I've been I've felt welcomed uh, being a part of the Advisory Council and I have felt welcomed and I know that my wife and her daughter who spent there my my stepdaughter Sarah she was born in Jerusalem spent her childhood in Jerusalem in Palestine Right, and um, a lot of the experiences you're sharing, you know, she's having to go through now, and um, it's through the efforts of the programming that you're putting together that I'm seeing those dividends pay out for our child. You know, we're seeing a, a very different experience for Sarah. There's still issues. Don't get me wrong. There's still challenges, and you know, when we're talking about creating space for many different kinds of cultures, that's, that can be a difficult thing to grapple with from, uh, from someone that's not used to it, right? But, but on the whole, um, it's, it's Sarah that, that is important here, right? It's that next generation, the future prosperity of our community is wrapped up in what we're talking about here. It is, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being a part of the show. I'm so glad that you were willing to do this interview. And um, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this is Peace Talks. It's brought to you by Community Wealth Development. Uh, and uh, as you've seen today, we speak with folks from all over uh, the Vermont, Vermont, from many different walks of life that are all seeking to build peace in our communities today. And I think we've seen a really incredible example of that with Tamara Parks. Oh, thank you. It's always great to collaborate with you, Daniel. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks.